Aloha, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to the Hawaii Book and Music Festival. My name is Robert Perkinson. I'm a professor at UH um, in American Studies. I'm coordinator of UH's Better Tomorrow speaker series, and I will be your moderator today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about UH off campus and in the community. Research universities are big and complex institutions, and so they have an array of community impacts. We educate students, of course, we train them for jobs that ex exist now. We also train them for jobs that no one has dreamed up yet, which is a really important role that universities serve. Um, we equip students, I believe, to lead richer cultural lives, more thoughtful lives, to contribute in healthier ways to the functioning of a democracy, as we have learned recently, is rather important. Um, research universities, another pillar of them is that they generate new knowledge. And that means we nurture all types of inquiry in all sorts of fields. Sometimes this means managing massive research grants. Um, all of this helps us understand how the world works scientifically, culturally, socially, um, and also lays the groundwork for innovation of every conceivable type. And that's why new industries, you know, from the late 20th century forward typically sprout up around research universities, just like Silicon Valley did around Berkeley and Stanford. Um, those twin pillars of the university teaching and research, you know, keep the economy humming. They're directly responsible, according to you hero estimates for some 23,000 jobs in Hawaii, many more jobs indirectly. But it's also important to realize that there's a third way role that universities play, and that is helping solve public problems from economic forecasting to emergency deployment of public health and public health workers to localized climate change mapping to agricultural extension agents that are sent all over the state. A research university like Manoa isn't just having an impact through its activities on campus, it's also doing community work directly from Hilo to the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. Um, and our topic today is UH in the community. And we have three guests. First, Michael, who's here with us already, the provost of UH Manoa. Later, we'll talk to Judy Limas, who's the interim director of the Hawaii's Institute for Marine Bio Biology, or HIMB, who's just gone on sabbatical. And also, Lee Buen Consejo Lum, who's the associate dean of the John A. Burns School of Medicine. Um, a note on format. We've been harvesting questions online and working, and we will work them into the conversation. But we also want to hear from you now. If you are joining us on Zoom, you can post questions and comments in the Q&A module, um, and we'll do our best to respond to them. If you're watching on YouTube or Twitter, probably not Facebook today, then you can post there as well. Um, and we have students who are helping us monitor those channels as well. Um, before I start talking to Michael, I just wanted to say that he is not just the provost of our flagship campus, but also a respected um, scientist, the author of more than 100 technical publications. He got his PhD in civil and ocean engineering from MIT. Um, he has a new book out, The Urban Ocean, which is actually directly related to many of the topics we are discussing today as it deals with all of the complex ways that coastal cities are shaped by their ocean environments and how we can better manage our relationship to those ecosystems, especially in this age of climate crisis. Um, Michael, there's been so much attention to the, all, the institution managing COVID that many people may not have realized that, they're, that according to our primary traditional metrics, there's actually a lot of good news at Manoa. And I just wondered if you might tell us some, some of those surprising numbers, or at least they may seem surprising to some, like. Um, for instance, with respect to enrollment. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Thanks for those kind words. Um, yeah, the, 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 the message coming out of Manoa is really entirely positive um, by all of the metrics by which a university judges itself. We are doing, doing extraordinarily well. Um, even through this pandemic, we have a enrollment of 19,100 students this fall. That is the largest enrollment that we've had at Manoa since 2014. Even more impressively and very important, we have the largest entering class 
in the 114 year history of the universe. Wow. Yeah, so just, just amazing. Of course, we want to now retain them and move them to graduation, but our numbers in terms of retention and graduation rates are also going up as are all of our rankings across all of the domestic and international rankings. So um, yeah, we're doing, we're doing terrific. And I, I think we'll talk about research and other areas as well, but certainly- Yeah, I mean, right. go ahead. No, just it's a great story on enrollment. That that is good news. Yeah, I now we are seeing it in my Department of American Studies just in class enrollments that classes are filling a little faster, and it's good to see lots of enthusiastic faces in two dimensions or three. <laughs> um, fundraising, which a, a lot of that has been um, in response to COVID, providing student assistance, that's also up overall. Is that right? It is. Uh, I, I can report on behalf of the UH Foundation that if, if we removed the two years in which Jay Scheidler gave extraordinary gifts to the university, in, if we remove those two years, this past year was the strongest fundraising year in the history of the foundation. So again, and that, you know, it's, it's what, what's most incredible to me uh, that is that like enrollment, UH Manoa is bucking a national trend. We're seeing an increase in our numbers in terms of total numbers of donor, donors and in terms of the actual fundraising. We're, we're up 16% from wow. the year prior to the pandemic. And that year was up 29% over the year before. So, you know, again, just like enrollment, Manoa is seeing continuing year over year, and we are totally outperforming our peers around the nation. Yeah, folks should know that the, I mean, the total amount of money also that we bring in for research dollars is, is roughly comparable to the total dollars allocated by the state. Is that right? Uh, yeah, that sounds right about right about right and and we have to which makes it a good bang for buck agency is all is my point there <laughs> it is because, among many other reasons yeah those dollars each dollar that's brought in via research grants um has associated with it other dollars that are leveraged by the faculty so and and those dollars go into hiring people who then pay taxes they go into purchasing supplies um, which goes out into the community. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, as you hear, you hero has done many studies that have pointed to those those uh, impacts across the community. Yeah, it's been it's been hard for students, especially new grad students or new freshman students who show up and haven't really ever had that full social experience of being at our campus. But I've I've been impressed with my own students, both grad students and undergrad students, how how well they've adapted and are figuring out ways to thrive. Um, yeah. You know, and how well they've had to just grapple with all sorts of things, getting moved from the dorms into a hotel because they got exposed, or um, they've had to roll with it for sure. Yeah, yeah, we are hoping. We are hoping that some of the restrictions will will ease up now that our cases um, on per capita basis this morning were as low as California. Um, so that's a dr dramatic improvement. Well, um, writing the downside of this Delta wave does bring us um, bring an elephant in the room into view, um, which is athletics. Oof. Um, uh, the elephant happens to be doing a bit of a victory dance at the moment from homecoming. So that's kind of welcome news. But what's your, first of all, you know, what's UH's case for why um, you believe that UH can invite spectators back safely? We believe that the plan that we have will guarantee that our new stadium, which nobody has yet seen, will be actually the safest place on Oahu at which to watch the game much safer than being in a bar without a mask, surrounded by people whose vaccination status you may not know or 
you know, they may be tested, but, you know, we are guaranteeing that every fan at our events will be vaccinated. We're guaranteeing- And it's outside. It's outside and they will be wearing a mask. So, you know, every healthcare professional, including Dr. Buenconseo Lum, um, has said this will be as safe an environment as you can possibly have. And she may speak to that. I know that she and others on our health and wellness team had a very good meeting with the mayor and his advisors. And the mayor is supporting our plan. It really is just now up to the governor to just, um, you know, let's let's follow the science. It's time to allow fans. And now, you know, we're in a situation where we have three weeks between now and the next home game. So I expect our numbers will go down even more and hopefully the governor will look at our plan and, and agree it's a strong one. Just so people have a sense of all the diversity of research that goes on at the UH, uh, at UH, maybe I'm curious to hear a tiny bit about your your own research. I think you deal with squid bacterial symbiosis and and then we'll turn to UH community symbiosis after that. Sure. Um, yeah, and I will just mention that um, this is an area that I have done work in, um, but I'm not currently researching it. But it is such a cool system that I'm glad that you asked about it because it um, the the system is the Hawaiian bobtail squid. It's a very small little squid, about walnut size, and it lives in a symbiosis with um, bacteria that make light. So what we call bioluminescent bacteria, and they use that light actually to camouflage themselves in the nighttime ocean when they're feeding. And um, that system e ecologically is very cool in itself. Um, but one of the other reasons why it's really important as a study system is that it actually helps us understand how our own tissues as a multicellular organism, what we call eukaryotes, interact with bacteria because that system is so specific and we can take the bacteria away and we can give it back to the, the squid. And so there's a lot of research actually be done, being done by other labs um, at um, UH Manoa trying to understand the dynamics of that system. And so it's just a really wonderful example of how a local organism is really providing a lot of information about um, much broader issues in terms of um, our, own, our own physiologies with bacterial systems. Um, so I presume this, even though you've been doing uh, very important administrative work, um, I presume this research is continuing. Um, how, how was it, how did HIMB generally cope with the disruptions of COVID, of COVID to keep the research enterprise going? Because I suspect that you'll speak for a lot of faculty across campus um, in explaining some of how you made the transition. Um, sure, yes. I think um, pivot was a good word that was mentioned um, earlier. And so let me just, I'll just say a little bit about what HIMB is and does, and then um, I can kind of tell you um, sort of how we addressed some of those things. It's We are a research institute that studies everything from marine bacteria to marine mammals. Um, and we really focus on the ecosystem health of the marine environment um, and our associated coral reefs. Um, so uh, we are looking at sort of the ecosystem health on the on the ocean side. And um, interestingly, for a um, research institute, we actually have four faculty education specialists. I am one of them, but we actually have three others as well. So we really um, integrate research and education in our programming. Um, we do have researchers that do um, very um, basic and applied research. And then we have educators that actually take that information and apply it to some of our educational programming. But um, in terms of our research enterprise, um, one of the really big impacts for us was that we do a lot of diving. So we have to get in the water um, to do our research. And um, COVID really actually impacted that quite a bit because when you're diving, you're in a boat, you're usually in a smaller boat. Um, we do mostly coastal research. So we're in a small boat um, in close approximation to other folks. And early on that actually really impacted our research. We had to um, pivot. Um, our diving operations were actually suspended for a while. We needed to sort of work on other kinds of field um, activities. Um, we worked on um, lab 
research. A lot of our researchers focus then on the lab aspect of, of their own work, but rotating people through their labs so that we didn't have too many people at once all in, in laboratories until we really started to develop. Um, and UH was really instrumental in this in terms of um, providing guidelines on a continuing basis for how we actually can all safely interact with one another. And so we've, we eventually got around um, to continuing our field research. We're back at diving. Everyone is very productive again, and we're really glad to actually be out um, on the water and, and, and in the community because the other impact that we had was that our, our education programs that happen both in person on Moko Oloi but also in the community were heavily impacted. And so we did a lot of um, pivoting in that um, sense. I wanted to ask you one other question about a multifaceted program, and that is um, the ecosystem restoration around the Haya fish pond that you're working on that it seems like it has educational components, research components, um, Native Hawaiian cultural development components. Um, so I just, you know, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about that that project and what makes it unique. Sure, yeah. The, um, it, it is the um, newest um, of the National, National Estuarine Research Reserve System. So that is a um, nationwide system. I think that there are about 30 of those centers around the US in the um, coastal regions and Great Lakes. Um, so Hea -E was the most recently designated, although I think that there's one being designated now again. Um, and that was back in 2017. And what was really, I think, um, important about this and the resilience of that program with our community partners is that it came it, as a result of our deep partnership with um, our local community organizations between HIMB. And it was actually the community that really invited HIMB to become a part of this partnership to propose um, a NIR, they're called NIRs, N-E-R-R, -R, um, in the Heea watershed, in the Ahupua of Heea. And the focus of it is also unique because unlike many other research reserves, the, the idea is not to go back to some pristine environment that we actually know now is probably not attainable in our current, um, in our current uh, modern living environment and um, through a lot of uh, challenges that that system has already faced. But the focus was to restore indigenous resource management. And so this Heia Ahupua'a piece of that, including HIMB, which serves as the administrative lead, is really leading that effort and um, this idea of uh, cultural resource management um, and uh, biocultural diversity. And um, we are just a partner. We are the administrative lead, but like I said, we really actually take our cues from our community partners who we view as the leads of this. And I think because this program was so embedded in the community and distributed among many partners, during the pandemic, we actually able to continue that work. That community work was already happening in all of those distributed lo locations um, and they were all doing their important work. And so that, that program actually has been very resilient in itself while actually working on resilience of an ecological system. How was your personal research or those of your closest collaborators um, impacted by COVID and, and how much has it been reshaped by, by the pandemic? Yeah, so, you know, I must say that um, it was uh, that the issue of internet connectivity from the US Pacific has been a huge challenge um, that, uh, you know, has um, has really, uh, I, I mean, challenge is not strong enough of, of a word. And our colleagues uh, at the Social Science Research Institute with the Pacific Based Intel Health Resource Center, um, also TASI, previously known as PSAT, you know, they, they uh, have been working with the Pacific and, and have we, you know, again, for over 20 years. And it's fortunate that um, uh, many of the jurisdictions that got better access to the internet, broadband connections, um, uh, and in some of it, it's, uh, you know, still not what we see here in Hawaii, but it's definitely better than 28.8 dial-up speeds, which is what it was like about, uh, you know, six years ago. And so some of those things were put in place. Uh, and thank goodness, because we had to shift a lot of things to Zoom. But, you know, there's just a lot of technological challenges and you can only get that 
you know, from within the hospital, uh, many of our colleagues actually don't have internet or fast internet at home. And so it's it's been difficult to meet. Uh, and then, you know, the type of work that we do, like with many of our colleagues um, throughout, uh, you know, Manoa, uh, it's, it's community-based, which means face-to-face, -face, right? These communities are yeah. relational. And uh, it, it's a little bit hard to do that with Zoom. But the good news is um, we've gotten in, into a rhythm and have regular meetings. We've actually held two pretty large uh, regional meetings with Zoom and there's ongoing education uh, and, and whatnot. So it's, it's you know, and that will stay, thank goodness. Uh, but, you know, there continue to be a need for face-to-face -face. and some of the jurisdictions are still closed, um, you know, to visitors uh, and others uh, were open, but then had to close again as, as they had surges, uh, you know, in, in August and September. And so travel remains a little bit of a challenge. Thank you.